Good morning. I'm Keith Jones from Keating Costello. I'm also one of the co-chairs of the Conference Education and Legal Forum Committee for CAI. I want to welcome you for coming to the Legal, Legislative, and Case Law Update. I just have a couple of housekeeping matters to address um, before we get started today. So, the main interest the session today is worth 1.5 CAI Continuing Education Credits. You must be scanned in to receive your credits. Um, scanned is at the entry way, so if you haven't been scanned in yet, please do so now. Evaluations and education certificates will be sent via email after the show. Um, CI is interested in your feedback as it helps to plan for the following years and next year. So for the education certificates, please print and keep them for your records. If you don't receive the email, please contact the CAI office um, pretty soon because after 30 days, the certificate reprints will carry a $25 processing fee. You can also stop by our registration on your way out and print a certificate which lists all the classes you attended um, and the credits you earned. So a couple of reminders about the show. If you haven't already, please download the mobile app. The mobile app contains everything about the show from the schedule, layout, and exhibit of the exhibit hall and the program handouts. Right after this session, the exhibit hall is going to be open until 1.30 this afternoon. So now the disclaimer that I have to read. CAI shall be entitled to use any photographs, recordings, and other likenesses of this event or any attendees or participants at this event um, and any advertisement, promotion, or reproduction of this event in any manner. So these images are for the sole use of CAI, its members and chapters, and any content or images from this program, including written or recorded materials, may not be used in a court of law or, other purpose, or for other purposes not authorized by CAI. Now I'd like to introduce the sponsor of this session, Lieberman Management Services, and I'll turn this over to John from Lieberman. Wow. This organization has grown. 
this event has grown, and this is probably the premier uh, educational event for community associations, um, in certainly in the state of Illinois, and uh, I'm very proud to be a part of it, always have been. I'm up here today to talk to you about the PAC, the Illinois Political Action Committee, and the differences between the PAC and ILAC, the Illinois Legislative Action Committee. Um, essentially, the Legislative Action Committee is not allowed by charter to make political contributions. So we formed a PAC last year to uh, solicit donations, to collect funds, and to work with the PAC in making donations to the campaigns of legislators that are friendly to community association issues. And we know, and you're going to hear, there, there have been a lot, there are a lot, and there's a lot of people that are volunteering their time um, to work to the benefit of community associations. So, um, you see up here, on the bottom part is the PAC, and you can see the differences between the LAC and the PAC, and I forget about all the uh, uh, initials, because I know they're confusing. But I do invite you and ask you, so please, when you go into the great show, take a right turn when you walk in the door, stop by our booth, and if you have it any way possible uh, in your mind, in your will to contribute to the PAC. We need your support and we need your money so we can con continue the good work that the ILAC has done. Thank you very much. It's great to see you all here today and I uh, hope you enjoy your day. Thanks, Bill. Um, before we get started on some some of the other matters. I would like to point out a couple other things on the screen though, and, and most critically, uh, if you look, there is going to be a fundraiser for the Illinois Legislative Action Committee. That's going to be in October. It is at Five Roses in Rosemont, and anybody here on the fundraising committee? No, I guess not. It's, supposed to, it's going to be a casino night, so the idea is to come, have fun, uh, use use the, the chips for contributions and hopefully everybody will have an opportunity to socialize, find out more about the Legislative Action Committee and what we do. Before I let the people out of the panel introduce themselves, one of the things, I know a lot of people come to these sessions and they want to find out about legislation and they want to find out what happened, what's happening, how the case law has changed. Our committee is 15 volunteer members. We work together to support bills, to oppose bills, to come up with reasoning as to why we think bills are important to associations or harmful to associations. But ultimately, we need your efforts. So please go on to CAI's website. Please make sure you're getting the email updates. Please make sure that you're writing contact with your legislators, submitting slip opinions when things are in committee. Follow these things, because these are important for you folks to speak out to your representatives and let them know how you feel. They can talk to me, you know, they can talk to a couple other people on the committee, they can talk to Jeff Dixon, but ultimately, you're the constituency and what you feel about this is very important. So before we get into the bills from last year and the bills from this year and some case law, I'm gonna let the people on the panel have an opportunity to introduce themselves. Good morning. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Dixon, and my firm, Dixon & Company, has represented the Community Associations Institute in Illinois for more than 10 years. So I serve as your lobbyist in Springfield. I work with these fine legislators uh, to try to pass legislation that, that benefits this industry. So I want to turn it over to each one of these folks. I'd like, we'd like to have them introduce themselves, tell, them, tell you where they're from, uh, what their involvement has been, uh, in this industry because they've worked closely with us and have been very helpful. I'll turn it over to the first person to my left, uh, Chicago Alderman Michelle Smith. Good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Smith. I'm the Alderman of what's called the 43rd Ward in Chicago, Illinois. I don't know if there are any Chicagoans here. Um, I hope you let me know. Uh, I represent the communities of Lincoln Park and the Gold Coast, and in that capacity, represent about 25,000 people who are members of condominiums and homeowners associations. Good morning, my name is Elaine Neckritz. I'm a state representative. I represent parts of uh, uh, 
north and northwest suburban Cook County, North Road, Wheeling, Buffalo Grove, Arlington Heights, Palatine, Mount Prospect, and Prospect Heights. A lot of um, condominiums and uh, homeowners associations in my district, uh, and I live in one that's managed by Lieberman Management. So, and I've uh, been active in these issues for a very long time, mostly because I heard from constituents about uh, things that they either wanted done or wanted changed uh, in the in the kind of law. So I'm happy to be here once again. Uh, good morning. I uh, my name is Stephanie Kipowit. I'm also a state representative. My district is the 84th district, which encompasses Aurora, Naperville, Oswego, and uh, Montgomery. So it's an honor and privilege to be here today. I've been a state representative for four years, and about I would say 80% of my district is condos and homeowners associations. Uh, I work quite closely with <coughs> Balm Property Management. Anybody here know Mike Balm? He's kind of shy. You know, he's a little shy guy. You know. Um, and so, really, uh, one of the big things, as as Representative Deckard said, is trying to meet and balance the uh, the need to do a proper job as you all managing the property and also uh, listening to our residents. So at least once or twice a year, I actually host a town hall meeting and we discuss homeowners associations and, and management issues that come up in the district. Good morning, my name is Senator Mike Hastings. I once was the youngest senator in the Illinois Senate. I used to have a six pack and slick hair, now I don't. <laughs> I represent uh, the greater south suburbs of Chicago, so if you live in between Lockport, Joliet, all the way east to Markham and Madison, I'm your guy, whether you like it or not. Um, we're the interstate district. We have I-80, I-57, I-55, and I-355. I represent 20 municipalities, and it's an honor to serve, and, uh, and I'm a sponsor of uh, a lot of your laws. So I look forward to hearing your questions in this discussion. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, State Representative Robert Hartwick. I, any of you were here last year, I had the pleasure of coming and joining you last year as well to talk about legislation. I sponsored a number of pieces of legislation uh, that were initiatives of your organization and that did pass and become law. Um, uh, I, I represent the northwest side of the city of Chicago, so not very far from here, actually. So I represent Jefferson Park, Portage Park, uh, Gladstone Park, and Dunning areas of Chicago, as well as parts of Norwich, Harwood Heights, Elmwood Park, and River Grove. Um, happy to work with you. You have an excellent, excellent uh, representative on legislative matters, Mr. Dixon, um, and you know, uh, I've developed a very good working relationship with him. He does a great job of representing your interests and making sure that those bills that are important to you make their way through the legislature in an expeditious fashion. So, thank you for having me here today. I look forward to the discussion. Again, uh, thank you to our panelists for being here. Uh, they're very busy people, and we appreciate them taking the time to be here with us this morning. And, and as Representative Barwick said, he did sponsor uh, three of our bills that were signed into law last year. Everyone at this table, uh, all of our panelists, have worked on legislation that's been signed into law. So I'm very pleased they're here. Again, they're fine legislators, and feel free to ask questions as we move along. I'm going to give a, an update. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief uh, from Springfield, and then I'll turn it back over to Pat to begin discussion. So last month, the new 100th General Assembly was sworn into office. Uh, governor Rauner gave his State of the State address, and then a few weeks ago, the governor gave his budget address. Go governor Bruce Rauner is a Republican. Uh, the legislature is dominated by the Democrats. The, the Illinois Senate, uh, Senate President John Cullerton, uh, has a veto-proof majority in the Senate. House Speaker Michael Madigan has a large majority in the House. So, so the Democrats more or less control things in the General Assembly, uh, uh, albeit our budget uh, crisis in Springfield. So the, the two Republican leaders uh, remain the same, just so you know. Uh, and the four leaders are good leaders. The Republican leaders are Christine Madonio uh, in the Senate and Jim Durkin in the House. Those four leaders are trying to work out 
uh, a budget compromise along with our legislators that are here today. So while the state of Illinois is in a budget uh, stalemate, um, there still have been more than 6,000 pieces of legislation introduced in the General Assembly just in the first two months that they've been meeting. The legislature is gearing up for a busy session, and we're tracking and monitoring more than 50 pieces of legislation that affect community associations and uh, industry. Um, we have also introduced a package of condo bills on behalf of CAI, working with PAC and, and the ILAP, and the folks at this table uh, are sponsors and supporters of those bills. Two of those bills have already passed committee. Uh, they're on the floors of their respective chambers on uh, second reading, uh, which means they'll likely get heard sometime in March, and hopefully will pass on to their respective chambers. So in the next month, the pace picks up. There's deadlines to pass bills out of the committee in the mid middle of March, and by the end of April, deadlines for bills to pass the respective chambers. In May, the pace picks up considerably with deadlines to pass bills out of both chambers and to meet the adjournment deadline of May 31st. The community associations industry has become a well-known entity at the state capitol. Uh, over the last 10 years or so, uh, we have seen so many more pieces of legislation affecting condos that are addressed passed and signed into law. So, the point is what I, that I want to stress today that I think I stressed last year and the panel also mentioned. What can you do to help in our efforts in Springfield in the legislative process? First of all, you can get to know your state senator and your state representative. Go meet with them. Talk to them about the industry. Try to educate them on community associations. Invite them to your place of work. Because keep in mind, that in Springfield, these legislators hear from everybody all the time. Yeah, they hear from me, but they hear from the other side. And there's always two sides to a bill. Not always, but a lot of times. And we might have a great piece of legislation, but we might have opposition. So there might, there's going to come a time where we might, want to, we might need some help. And effective grassroots lobbying really does start with you in the field. So we ask that we know you're busy, but when you can help, get involved, it would really make a difference. It's pretty good. Relationships, again, are so important in this business. And we're doing pretty well in Springfield, but we could, we could use some help from those of you in the field. Again, you'll be, you'll be helping to protect this industry, but you'll be helping to protect your own business as well. So I think at this time I'm going to turn it back over to, to Pat. I could talk forever. I'm not going to do that. Uh, to get going on legislation, and again, our panelists will jump in uh, when they choose to, and, and uh, uh, I think Charles will walk around too, so we can take some questions. Thanks, Pat. We're going to we're going to have uh, some, some questions a little bit later on, so we're going to try to get through some of the material up front. I know with the speed by which information travels now, by February, spending a lot of time about bills that passed in July of last year. Most of you have already read about them. Most of you are probably familiar with some aspects of it. A lot of you have probably already implemented these bills since some of them were effective immediately or effective in January. So let's cover a couple of bills, especially um, I'd like to thank uh, Representative Mark for the first three bills we're going to talk about. He was the House sponsor on these bills. So um, Bob, you want to jump in whenever you, whenever you feel. But the first one we're going to talk about, I, I think people generally know it as either the executive session or the closed portion of the meeting bill that passed in 2016. The CAI's Legislative Action Committee had been talking about what to do about discussions and board meetings. And everyone remembers the Palm decision and the fallout from the Palm decision and fear that we won't be able to do business the way that we used to do business. Well, maybe some of that was okay. But there were some things that needed to be done. Two years ago, we passed legislation that dealt with emergency situations, where the boards could act outside of the presence of an open board meeting on an emergency basis, with some specific definitions as what constitutes an emergency. This year, we started talking about the executive session or the closed portion of the meetings. And a couple of things came up. One of them was, are we, do we really have to call a meeting every time we want to go into solely a closed portion of the meeting? 
So we propose, you know what, if it's only going to be closed discussions, and these are the enumerated things that can be discussed in a closed session, if that's all that's going to be discussed, that can be done by the board without calling the meeting. Why? We don't want to frustrate the owners to show up, come to the clubhouse, come to the <laughs> library, come to the police department, and then have them say, oh, by the way, this is all a closed portion of the meeting. So we included in there that there are these items, and again, it's these items that are specifically enumerated, can be discussed in a closed portion of the meeting, even without notice. The other thing we talked about is some of the statute didn't really work anymore. It talked about employees, being able to discuss employee issues. And some of the concerns were, we're community, we don't have an employee. We have a contractor, we have a managing agent, we have a landscaper, a maintenance person. But if we're going to be discussing hiring, firing, disciplining this person, should that really be done in an open meeting? We changed the statute a little bit to encompass those things. Um, Rob, anything you want to add about this? Um, so, I guess my take on these bills, and it's very similar to the bills that we talked about when I was here last year, was that to me, the whole idea of kind of being association was trying to strike that. I mean, you are really an elected democracy in your in your in your homeowners associations, their kind of name associations, and so trying to strike that balance of, of what authority you should have and on what rights the the owner should have. And to me, this one just made perfect sense. <laughs> to some extent, um, I think as we all know, uh, unit owners. Uh, elect a board to handle the details of, of managing the property so that they don't have to do it. And so some of these uh, were really, two, two of these bills specifically were about uh, making sure that we are striking a balance so the boards can act efficiently and get things done in a timely manner, the way that the unit owners really want them to be done. So I, I, I don't know, that was my take on those two bills, if I could put it in that 10,000 foot level. <laughs> well, and, but, but I think it's imperative for people to understand, this does not mean that we're going back to workshops. Um, after this bill passed, I probably got three phone calls saying, well, we can have budget workshops now. And I said, budget discussion is not one of the things in the statute. Look to what it says. Um, and we'll, when we discuss the case law, we can get into some of these discussions. But what the courts are telling us as well is, if that's what the statute says, that's what it means. If it says shall, that's mandatory. These aren't optional things. We can't just say, well, we don't want to do it this way. The legislation actually means something. And we're not trying to allow board actions to happen outside of the presence of the members. There are certain things that probably should be discussed, though, in a private matter. Um, remember, discussed, not voted on. The votes still happen at open meetings, OK? So even if it's an item that's subject to one of these six items, that's discussion. And I think that's really important. And as Robert pointed out, it strikes the balance between the owners and their ability to see what's going on and hear what's going on, and the board's ability to administer the association. And one of the other bills he sponsored, I think he alluded to this, is there were a couple words in the Illinois Condominium Property Act that allowed associations generally to obtain a loan for their members. Well, when you look back at some of the old declarations, it would cap that, or it would prevent the board being able to obtain a loan without getting two-thirds or a different threshold homeowner approval. There were just a couple of words in the statute. It granted the board the authority, but then it said, unless the documents otherwise provide. Those words as came out this year under Section 18.4M. So now boards have the authority, subject to the rest of their documents and compliance with their documents, to be able to obtain loans for maintenance, replacement, and repair items at their community. That's not a loan to go out and build a brand new gazebo. That's not a loan to go out and put a pool where one doesn't exist. Those are capital improvements that are probably subject to other limitations. What we're talking about is enabling the association to be able to borrow money and pledge assessments in order to perform the repairs, replacement, and maintenance items on the buildings at the condominium. Um, and, and the, the other bill that, that uh, Representative Martin sponsored was a successor developer bill. Uh, if someone comes in, and we're seeing less and less of this as the real estate market is kind of firmed up a little bit, but for a lot of time, when developers were failing, 
The next thing that would happen is the bank would foreclose or some other developer would come and buy the property. Maybe that's two thirds of the property, maybe that's 10 units. And we kept hearing from developers, well, I'm the new declarant and I have all the rights under the declaration. Maybe, but you haven't done anything to articulate those rights. So we amended the legislation, included new legislation that says, if that's true, it has to be by written instrument and it has to be reported. Why? Well, kind of the same thing we're talking about the board. So everybody knows out there we can look at, it, log on to the recorder's office website and find out whether or not you really are the new successor developer. Yeah, I, I would just say that, you know, like in, in every unit of government, uh, uh, and, and again, I think that condominium associations is a form of governance, we want transparency. This creates transparency and clarity about the laws. This was a big problem. Uh, I, I, I practice real estate law, so a lot of my clients uh, were dealing with this sort of situation where uh, during the, the, the housing bubble where these developers would go belly up, a successor would come in, and the unit owners were really, it, it made it very, very difficult for them, very trying times not knowing what was going on. This helps, hopefully, hopefully we don't have one of those situations again, but the event that there is this sort of situation pops up, we have that transparency, we know what's going on. So it just was a very common sense. <coughs> Real quick, um, one more just simple piece of legislation. In 2015, we amended the Condominium Property Act to uh, clean up some of the provisions that allowed the board to amend their declaration without a homeowner vote for compliance. And it was typically known as the errors and omissions provision, where if there was an error in the declaration or there was an omission, the board could come in and correct it. Why? Because it's a mistake and you're trying to fix it. We also then included in there that, that that involved compliance with the law. So if your declaration says that the notice for an annual meeting could go out between 20 and 40 days, and the law says the notice has to go out between 10 and 30 days, the board alone could correct the declaration to include it 10 and 30 days consistent with the law. In 2016, we adopted, or we, the legislature uh, passed a bill which included that in the Common Interest Community Association Act. So both of those acts now read consistent with one another. Uh, the last bill we're going to talk about is 2016. Is I feel like a bill that we talk about every year, or at least some portion of the bill every year, um, ombudsperson legislation. Uh, there was more amendments to the ombudsperson bill in 2016. Um, before I go out, Representative Memphis, any, any initial? As, as Jeff pointed out, uh, with, with the transition in the, in the governor's office, uh, we had new folks overseeing the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation who were not uh, particularly enamored with the initial version of the Ombudsman Act that we passed and wanted to, uh, to renegotiate that. Uh, and uh, my feeling was always better to have a willing partner in the oversight agency than an unwilling partner. And so we uh, sat down and negotiated with them and came to an agreement about uh, some new provisions for the Ombudsman Act. It, 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 it did involve a lot of negotiations and there were a lot of different stakeholders and a lot of different ideas as to where this department should go, what it should mean. Everything from get rid of it completely and forget about it to let's leave it in place and let's see how it plays out. One of the concerns we had last year is this was a piece of legislation that really hadn't even been acted on, and we were already being told that it couldn't be done. Um, I believe Representative Neckert said, why don't we see whether or not that could be done first before we make that decision. And But the department did have some concerns, and they were addressed in the legislation. Uh, one of the things that it did is, for everyone who may recall, there was an obligation that a